You walk with me through fire 
So many great musicians in this church, amen? amen. We're going to have a concert this afternoon, and uh, we've got a, a lot going on in the music department. It's fantastic. So I have been studying a new subject called quantitative analysis. Has anybody ever studied quantitative analysis? Does anybody who hasn't studied it have any idea what it means? No. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty obscure field, but what it is, is it's taking word problems, taking business problems, taking other kinds of real life problems and translating them into mathematical equations. And so what they do is they say, well the problem is we want, a, uh, we, we want to maximize profits on the sale of widgets and, uh, and we have this many workers and we have this much raw material and you turn all those into numbers and you run an equation see how it works. Well. I didn't realize that that was in the Bible, but it is. Turn to 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 15. Now, my mathematical deficits are well known. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. Um, I am actually physically capable, incapable of long dividing by a two-digit number. I don't know how to do that anymore. I did know how to do that once. Uh, but after having passed the test, I completely forgot. And I cannot do it any longer. So if I don't have a calculator and I have to divide by a two-digit number, it's just going to have to be somebody who's going to have to help me because it's not going to work otherwise. Here in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 15, I want to start with the very first sentence. He introduces his subject, and his subject is not giving. Okay, I've, I've gone two years here. Almost, not quite. I've gone two years almost here, and I have never talked to you about stewardship. You're welcome. <laughs> I am not going to apologize for talking about stewardship today. Jesus talked about stewardship rather a great deal. And here is Paul talking about it. But keep in mind, the subject of his 
paragraphs his chapter is, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And he's about to talk about the Macedonian churches and their giving. But he doesn't call it their giving. He calls it the grace of God given to the Macedonians. Their ability to give, Paul defines as God's grace on them. Now, here's where the big equation comes. We've got our quantitative analysis working. Verse 2 that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the wealth of their generosity. Now, in quantitative analysis, what we do is we take that sentence and we, we make it into a mathematical equation. And the mathematical equation is the great trial of affliction plus abundance of joy plus deep poverty equals wealth of generosity. Well, that's a kind of a counterintuitive equation, isn't it? Great trial, deep poverty, and joy equals generosity. Did you know that? Paul doesn't lie. Paul says that these three things produce rich giving beyond their ability. So let me ask you this. Have you had great trial? Have you at some point had deep poverty? Okay, so what we're lacking here is joy. What we're lacking is the abundance of joy because it says here great trial plus deep poverty plus the abundance of joy. You know when you have an equation like that, the pluses, it doesn't matter what order they're in, right? Everybody knows how math works. It doesn't matter what order they're in. So we've all had great trial. We've all had deep poverty. Apparently what is lacking is our abundance of joy. Now, where does that joy come from? He goes on to explain it. Verse 3, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability, They were freely willing, imploring or begging us with much urgency that we would receive the gift of fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Now, we call this church mosaic for a reason. Did you notice the mosaic of people here? We have people from lots of different cultures and lots of different continents here, right? Bunches of different cultures and continents. We've got Asia, we've got Europe, we've got everybody here. Different cultures have different cultural sensibilities. And I'm not going to pick on anyone specifically, the Latins, but I think that my, my mother-in-law has explained it this way. She said that in the Latin culture, and you could judge the other cultures, I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not going to be ethnically stereotypical much, um, but in the Latin culture, she tells me, well, she lived there for 25 years in Latin America, and she tells me that when people in the Latin culture have someone appear in their home that they have to invite them to partake. Now she says that the first time that they ask you, they're asking you because of the cultural obligation, you always say no the first time. So when you're in a Latin home and they say, please, won't you stay for dinner? You say no. Because they're just asking because they have to ask. They're not asking because they want you to stay for dinner. He says, she says, the second time they ask you, you also say no. They're just being normal and appropriate to the culture. She says, if they ask you a third time, it may be that they really want you to stay for dinner, and then you can consider the offer. So she says, wait for the third offer before you accept. Now, I don't know what cultures you come from. The white North American Anglo culture is sort of like this. Someone comes to the door, you open the door, and you say, may I help you? Does your door leave, does your hand leave the doorknob? No, you have your hand firmly on the doorknob. You may even have a chain across the door, right? May I help you? Yes, we're coming to visit today. That's very nice. We really don't have time. And you close the door, right? A little different culture, a little bit less welcoming. I'm told that the Middle Eastern culture is also one where they have to feed you. I remember we used to have a Filipino Uh, family in our church in Houston and the Filipino family you couldn't go over there just to even pick something up at their house or you had to sit down and you had to eat some of those transparent noodles just had to I mean there's no way you get away without it Uh, it says that they implored us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints 
So the Macedonian church has said, no, 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 we want to give this. And Paul said, well, you know, and you don't have very much, and you're poor. And they said, no, but we're serious. We want to give this. And they forced them, they, they begged them to give the gift, to take the gift. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. There's another mathematical equation, isn't it? The Macedonian churches gave themselves to the Lord and then gave themselves to their leaders. Isn't that nice? Interesting lesson there. We could talk about that another week. So we urged Titus as he had be, that, that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace. What was the grace again? The grace of giving generously. The, that he would continue this grace, complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. So he talks about giving as a grace. And it's interesting. He kind of flatters the Corinthians, doesn't he? He said, well, you know, you, you abound in everything. Are you good at something? He, he told them what they were good in. He told them that they were good at faith and speech and knowledge and in diligence. These all sound like the fruits of the Spirit, don't they? He says, you've got all these other fruits of the Spirit, but let me suggest one more thing. Let me suggest that you abound also in the grace of giving. And then he qualifies it. Paul's good about this. He qualifies it. He says, look, this isn't a commandment. I'm not telling you what to do. I am certainly not here to tell you what you ought to give, how much you ought to give, or who you ought to give to. That's what Paul said. Did Paul have the right to tell him what to give and where to give and how to give? Certainly. He was an apostle. He could have said, the Lord has shown me that you're not giving enough. You need to give more. He could have said that, but he didn't. He said, I speak not by commandment, verse 8. But I am, what is this? Oh, this is a hard word. I'm testing, somebody read it, I love it. I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of another. You know, it's a little bit hard to understand there. Could it be that he's saying, I'm comparing the sincerity of your love to the diligence of others because he's just praised their diligence, hasn't he? He says, I'm gonna kinda test you by comparing you to the Macedonian churches. And then he goes on to the pinnacle text of this verse. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So what did he mean? Did he mean Jesus was rich? Did he mean Jesus was rich in stuff? Because, you know, the king is often rich, right? Right? Imagine that we lived back in a time when we were, there were kings, and the king was absolutely powerful. If the king came to your restaurant, would you charge him? No. If the king came to your hotel, would you charge him? No. In fact, if you go up and down the East Coast, even today, there are all kinds of hotels that say George Washington slept here. So they wouldn't charge the king. They would put up a brass plaque that said the king slept here. Jesus didn't have to be rich. He was a king. But what it says is he gave up his riches and became poor so that you might be rich. He isn't talking here about money. He's talking about his grace. He's saying he gave up his relationship with the Father, his intimate, loving relationship with the Father, in order that you might have his intimate relationship with the Father. He gave it up and went to the cross and lost his relationship with the Father so that you could have it. Well, that's a lot of grace. The question is, what does that grace do for us? What does that grace do for us? Is it something that we can do something about? You know, we talk about the law. We talk about the ways that we can change, the ways that we can do things, the ways that we can accomplish things, the ways that we can please God in love, right? But the question is, can you buy it? A lot of people give money to the church because they think they can gain favor or merit with God. I want to dispel any myth on that today. I don't care how many millions of dollars you give to the church. Well, I do care, but it will not affect your status in heaven. It will not affect your salvation in any way because if you can buy it, 
It is in grace. Did you know there's a lot of things we can buy these days that you couldn't buy in the past? I, I was, well, I, I'm kind of old now. Um, but many years ago, many years ago, when they had first opened Six Flags over Texas, we drove up from San Antonio, one of our rare vacations. We drove up from San Antonio. And in those days, Six Flags used to air condition the lines outdoors. Does anybody else remember that? Now, when you go to an amusement park, I don't know how many of you love amusement parks, but when you go to an amusement park, what you pay for at an amusement park is the right to stand in line. <laughs> and you can spend the entire day standing in line, and uh, it can be excruciating, especially in Texas. It can be really, really hot. And so, as a result, I'm not really big on amusement parks. But you go to Six Flags in the 1960s, and all those lines used to have great big chilled air air conditioner blowers that blew down on you while you stood in line. And it was so cool and so nice that you didn't mind it so much. I found another way to get over the, uh, the waiting in line problem, and that is that uh, many of these places now have a uh, all-you-can-eat buffet. So the kids can wait in line while I'm at the buffet. <laughs> Everybody gets what they want, right? It's a win-win. Um, they have a new deal, though, at Universal Studios. In addition to the $89 that you pay to get in, you can pay an extra $149 to skip all the lines. You pay $149, and you can walk straight past all those schlubs that only paid 89 and go straight to the front of the line and get on your ride. That's kind of neat. Didn't know you could buy that. In some cities in America, if you get thrown in jail, $90 a night will get you a private cell so that you don't have to be kept awake by all those noisy inmates. Isn't that nice? Apparently, a surrogate mother in India is now down to $8,000. You don't have to bother yourself with going through the process of becoming pregnant and bearing your own child. You can hire a woman for $8,000 to do that and then preserve your, you know, girlish figure. This is an amazing one I didn't know. One of the most endangered animals in the world, the black rhino. If you're caught with a black rhino horn on, in any country in the world, you'll be arrested. South Africa is now making it possible for you to shoot and kill a black rhino. Apparently, they're teaching the ranchers to breed the black rhino, and if they breed enough, they let them sell the privilege to shoot one for $250,000. I asked Donnie, would that change a farmer's life? $250,000, I think it might. I think it might. They say you can now buy a pass for the HOV lane, even if you're alone, $8. And there's a, a really good one for a Mosaic Church. It says that you can now buy the right to immigrate to the United States for $500,000 if you create 10 full-time jobs. That'll get you immigration papers. Only a half million dollars line up at the back. The Bible tells a story about what you can't buy. See, because if you can buy it, it isn't grace. If you can buy it, it isn't salvation. It may look like salvation to you. It may smell like salvation to you. For some people, shooting a black rhino may be their holy grail, but it isn't salvation. If you can buy it, it isn't salvation. The question is, what is it? that we have that gives us grace. And the story is told in Luke 7, chapter 36. And I'm told that I don't wait long enough for you to look it up. So Luke 7, 36, for those of you who like to look it up. Then one of the Pharisees asked to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at table with the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flax of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of this woman who is touching him 
for she is a sinner. Now, did he say that to Jesus? What did the Bible say? He thought it. And Jesus responded to his thoughts. Let's pray today that Jesus will respond to our thoughts in a meaningful way. So Jesus responds to the thought. And Jesus said, and I don't think Jesus said this in a whisper or in a passing. I'm picturing that you look at the words here. I'm picturing that this was said eye to eye, face to face. He looked him right in the eye and he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. You ever had a boss say that? You ever, you ever had the boss say, uh, come to my office today before you leave? How about the teacher? Come and see me before you leave class today. Or, I need to see you in the office. That's even worse, isn't it? Or, come to the office and close the door behind you. <laughs> that gets pretty serious, doesn't it? I remember I had a boss one time, boss's boss, he came to town and he pulled out all of my files. Steve, you understand this. Pulled out all of the files that I'd been working on for the last year. And he went through each file, page by painstaking page, and he asked question after question. Why did you ask this in the deposition? Why didn't you ask this in the deposition? Why did you say this? Why did you look at this? Why didn't you look this up? Why don't I see a brief on this subject? Why didn't you do this research? Why didn't you do that? Oh, and it went on for two and a half long hours. It was excruciating. And at one point, he became very quiet, and he didn't say any more. And I guess he was done. But he didn't say he was done. He just didn't say any more. And I think he was hoping I'd quit or something. And he said nothing else. And I said, well, is that all? And he looked at me, and he said, well, isn't that enough? <laughs> there was literal dancing in the halls when he was terminated. Um, I outlasted him. It's a good thing. So Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you. Now, for most of us, that would cause some butterflies in our stomach. Right now, if Jesus looked me in the eye and said, James, I have something to say to you, I think I might be a little anxious. How about you? But this guy was courageous. He said, what does your text say? Say it, teacher. I wish I'd have that kind of courage, don't you? When Jesus comes and says, I have something to say to you, I want to have the courage to say, you say it, I'm ready to hear it. And Jesus said there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose, the one who forgave him more. And then he said to him, you have rightly judged. And then he turned to the woman, but said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Imagine your favorite drink, your favorite drink on earth. I don't know what it is. I won't mention what mine is, Dr. Pepper. I, whatever your favorite drink is, and I know it's a sin, it's got caffeine in it, uh, but they have a caf decaffeinated version. It's not as good, but they have one. What is your favorite drink? Maybe it's the raspberry made from Olive Garden. That's pretty good, isn't it? The raspberry lemonade at Olive Garden, it's pretty good. They have a better drink at Olive Garden, uh, but it, it, they, they, call, they charge you each refill, so don't get that one. There's some good drinks out there. Imagine that you have a condition of chronic thirst, and you have the opportunity to swim in a sea of your favorite drink. It's kind of nice, isn't it? When, when you go to a, a, a restaurant or a bar, they give you salty peanuts, don't they? Why? To make you thirsty. So imagine you had chronic thirst and you were swimming in a sea of your favorite drink. Now, when I was a kid, we grew up, and our driveway was long. It 
longer than, it was from here to the back of the fellowship hall. And my parents didn't believe in cutting trees. So we, it was a long, snaky driveway, and uh, it was long like Janine's. If anybody's been down to Janine's driveway, it was not as long as Janine's, but it's almost as long as Janine's. And in South Texas, when you have a driveway like that, in order to make it hard, we use a thing called caliche. Does anybody know what caliche is? It's a crushed limestone that, that doesn't get sloppy when you get wet. It gets hard. It stays hard when wet is essentially what it is. It stays hard when wet. And so we make it, if you ever have a caliche driveway, just make sure that you don't open the windows of your house because it's very, very dusty. The other problem with caliche driveways is that they tend to get puddles in them. And if you don't fill the puddles, the puddles get bigger. It takes a long time. It's not like a sand or a mud driveway would, but they do get bigger. And so you got to fill the puddles in. So I grew up with a lot of puddles. The problem with puddles is you go to a puddle and the water looks clear as crystal until you touch it. And then all that caliche dust from the bottom swirls up into it and the puddle becomes muddy and hideous. The question I have for you today is are you swimming in an ocean of grace or are you dabbling in the puddles? The story that Jesus told of the debtors, one of them was forgiven a great deal and he swam in an ocean of grace. And the other one, who represented Simon in this story, right? The other one was dabbling in the puddles of grace. And so my question to you is, are you swimming in an ocean of grace or are you dabbling in the puddles? What is the difference? I'll tell you what the difference is. The difference between dabbling in the puddles and swimming in the ocean is a recognition of your need for grace. See, those people who think they're pretty good and that they'd almost be in heaven by themselves and they just need a little bit of God's grace to get them over the hump, dabble in the puddles of grace. But those of us who recognize that but for God's grace, our lives would be long since over, swim in the ocean of grace. If we swim in the ocean of grace, the grace of giving should not be difficult, should not be painful. And then he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Oh, there's all kinds of grace made available to each one of us. Our grace is clear. Our response to, to grace is the fruits of the Spirit. And one of the fruits of the Spirit, Paul identifies as the grace of giving. Now you say, well, now he's getting to us. Now he's going to talk to us about giving. I'm going to suggest a couple of things that you may not expect me to say. One is that there are only three New Testament models for giving. Jesus talks about tithing. But there are three post-Jesus New Testament illustrations of giving that Paul gives. One is giving for the needs of the saints. And Marilyn asked me this week, if that's what we're going to be judged by, and Jesus says so at the end, he says, what did you do with the widows? What did you do with the orphans? What did you do with the people in jail? What did you do with the people with no clothes? He said, she said, if that's what we're going to be judged by, shouldn't the community services room be the biggest room in the building? And I said, yes, it should. Yes, yes, it should. The second type of giving is giving for support of the ministry. Jesus talks about it quite a bit. He talks about muzzling the ox and all that. I don't know what they call my salary. And then they talk, he talks about giving for missions, sending missionaries out to spread the gospel. Those are the three kinds of giving that Paul talks about. And then, and we'll talk about tithing, but then he talks about giving liberally because these Corinthians apparently were a little bit more wealthy than the Macedonians and a little bit less likely to give. Could it be that there's another equation? Wealth plus satisfaction equals stinginess? 
Maybe there's another equation out there that we need to look at. So, let me finish with this. If you're swimming in a sea of grace, you will have joy and you will give liberally and freely. If you are dabbling in the puddles of grace, you're going to probably conserve all that you have. If you, believe it or not, in this church, there are people sitting here today who have never given any significant amount to the church. Believe it or not. There are people here who have never get, you know, there's a, there was a big news story on uh, NBC talked about how young people were getting excited about causes and it talked about this young person, this 20 something, 23 year old person gave $70 to a cause. Somebody should come over here and show them our books because we have young people give a lot more than $70 to a cause. We have 20 somethings that give a lot more than that to the cause. Now, I'll tell you this, and I'll, I don't look at the books. I don't know how much you give. I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to look at you the same if I did. Mostly those of you who give a lot, I wouldn't be able to look at you the same. So I don't look at what you give, but God does. I don't have to. Number one, if you have never given anything substantial to God financially, I'm going to ask you to take a step. Now, you know, I don't know about when you do it. But it seems to me that there's no time like now. If you have never given a substantial gift to the church, to God, I encourage you to take out an envelope and make a number. I'm not saying you have to turn it in today. You might have to go home and get your checkbook. You know, it's convenient not to bring your checkbook to church. You don't get tempted so much that way, you know. But I'd say take out an envelope and write something down so that you can break the threshold of being a non-giver. So if you're a non-giver, I'm talking to you. I'm calling you out. If you're swimming in a sea of grace, then I want to activate your generosity. Now, number two, for people who have given, I'm going to challenge people who have given to become regular givers. When you go to work for a job, and you work for two weeks, do you expect your boss to be a regular payer? This is yes. You sure do. And if God through your boss regularly rewards you, shouldn't you regularly return to God? Amen. Giving as you feel like it, when you feel like it, on the spur of the moment is really not a very competent or responsible way to treat your obligation to God, is it? So if you're a giver, I encourage you to become a regular giver. If you're already a regular giver, I encourage you to go straight to the Old Testament and read what the Old Testament says about tithe and become a tither. The Old Testament is full of instructions and blessings and pronouncements of blessings about tithe. So if you're a regular giver, I encourage you to make the next step and become a tither. And last, if you're already a tither, I'm going to encourage you to the final step of giving. I'm going to encourage you to become a lavish or extravagant giver. Somebody, I don't know who, at the end of last year gave $10,000 to the church. And when we asked them where they wanted it put, the treasurers asked, the answer was, wherever Y'all need it right now. Whatever y'all want to do, a special project, whatever the special project is, you just use it. Now, I couldn't give $10,000 today or anytime this year or next, but, but what is lavish to one may not be lavish to another. I remember the story of the widow who gave her two coins, and Jesus said it was all that she had. It was her entire net worth. That's lavish giving. That's, that's extravagant giving. The question is, have you ever given extravagantly so that you can receive an extravagant blessing? Have you ever given extravagantly and recognized that God has given you grace beyond measure, that you're swimming in a sea of grace? And so today, I want to pray for you. 
I want to pray for you that you'll move to whatever your next step in giving is. I want to pray for you that you will recognize, that we will all recognize that we swim in a sea of grace and this sea has a current. This sea is carrying us forward into God's kingdom. Are you swimming in a sea of grace? Get away from the puddles. Get away from the little streams. Get away from the trickles and the cups. Dive into God's grace. Recognize your need. Transform your life into a life of utter dependence on grace. Get out of the boat. Get into the water. Experience God's grace. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, each of us has our own tightness and our own restrictions in giving. Please let this grace be completed in us that we might know the joy of giving freely and generously and lovingly. Loosen our hands on our stuff. Open our minds to your love. And let us demonstrate your love and your grace in all the parts of our life, including the ones we keep in our pocket. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.